Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk about downflow on your foreman. The talk will be given by me. I'm Adam Ruzicka, so hello. And together with me, I have Andre Ezer, who will take part in this as well. Uh, before we get to the main topic, something about us. So I'll start with myself. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I must admit, I'm not the original author of neither Dynflow, nor Foreman Tasks, nor Foreman itself, but I kind of inherited some parts of it, and now I'm taking care of it. Uh, you can find me as Adam Ruzicka on GitHub, or Ruzicka on Freenode, or underscore Arus underscore on Twitter, in case you want to reach out to me. And now I'll pass the microphone to Andre. So I'm Andre there, and if you have questions uh, about Foreman tasks or Dynflow, direct them rather to Adam. But if he is on vacation, I I will try my best to answer <laughs> answer your questions. Uh, I'm definitely not an original author. I'm in this project just because uh, I was interested, and Adam. Uh, kind of was left alone there. So <laughs> I'm trying to help uh, as much as I can, but I'm in those projects for half a year and definitely not full time. So yeah, I'm doing my best, but uh, Adam is still a better go-to person. I'm Ezra Andre on GitHub and uh, Ezra on the IRC, if you want to reach out, if Adam is sick. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now that we have this out of the way, uh, let's get to the main topic and see what you learn today. So as you might have guessed from, uh, from the title, we will talk about Dynflow. You will learn what it is, why we have it, uh, then we'll spend a bit of time in the inter uh, in the internals of Dynflow. We'll take a look at some essential things about Dynflow that you kind of need to know until it starts making sense. Then we'll talk about some nice features it has. And because the other part of the title was Foreman, we will mention how it links to Foreman. That links link is Foreman tasks. So we will talk about that. Again, we will cover what it is, why we have it, some features it has in addition to Dynflow itself. Then we'll take a look how a traditional Dynflow deployment looks and what are the next steps and plans for the future and so on. So one more thing. Uh, let's do a little fun exercise. Please write into the chat. It will be a Twitter-like thing. So please write into the chat, what do you think Dynflow is? Wrong answers only. And let's see what we'll get. All right. In the meanwhile, uh, let's talk about what is Dynflow. So the I think it's even stated somewhere in the documentation. It's workflow engine written in Ruby. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not any wiser after hearing this. So let's try tackling it from a different angle. We could say that it is a smart background processing engine. Better? Yes? No? Let's try another one. It's not really just a background processing engine. I mean, it does process things in background. But it tries to do more than that. It's not just, hey, Dynflow, here's the one thing I want to do. Do it a million times in five seconds. That's not what Dynflow is meant for. So it tries to do something above that. And to rephrase, it's a solution for when pure background processing is not enough. And after a couple of slides, I think it will get much cleaner. And 
It's currently being used by Foreman and its plugins, even though you, if you want it, you could use it on itself, by itself. Uh, you could use it in any Rails-based project. You could even, you're not even bound on Rails. Last year on DEF CONF, we had a demo where Dimeflow interacted with some Java application and it was, the Java part was not nice, you know. So we kind of covered what it is, even though, even though not fully. So let's take a look at why we have it. As with most software, we needed to scratch our own itch. There was a problem we were having and we just needed to solve it. And there, was, there wasn't really anything that would fit all our needs. So we made something for ourselves. The itch was that we were integrating with two other systems which had their own tasking system and an asynchronous API. So instead of you know, sending a request and receiving a response, you would send a request and you would get a response in the way of, well, I'll work on it as a task one, two, three. Ask later. And then you would later ask and you would possibly get a response. Either it would tell you it's not done yet, or it would tell you it's done, or it would tell you, I've never seen this task before. So fun times. And that's the issue Dynflow was built to address. So to recap, we needed a way to orchestrate and track progress of execution, just so we don't end up in inconsistent state between Foreman and the two other systems. Now, the building blocks. Uh, okay, uh, this is the Dynflow console. I guess most of you have seen this, and it was a bit confusing at the first sight. Uh, Dynflow is built around three concepts. One is execution plan. The other is action, and the last one is step. Uh, I once tried to put some kind of diagram which would show the relationships between those, but it was rather confusing. So I'll try it a different way on an example. Here we have an execution plan for some kind of action. Let's skip the execution part for a bit and let's think about an action. An action is a template or a recipe of how to do a thing. It can be literally anything. It can be from something as simple as print hello world to the console to synchronize 7,000 repositories to 20 capsules. It can be anything, the sky is the limit. And so this is the action. And actions can be composed of different smaller actions. So you can piece them together into something bigger. Now, when you go to Dynflow and tell Dynflow, hey, here is my action, execute it for me. Dynflow does several things. First, it starts building an execution plan. And now that we kind of know what an action is, we can kind of define the execution plan. So while action is a recipe on how to do something, the execution plan is an instance of, or <laughs> let's think about action as a template. And then the execution plan is the rendered template. So one is the recipe and the other is concrete plan how to perform the thing. Uh, here, as an example, I'm having a tea party and I'm making tea. So I tell Dynflow, hey Dynflow, make tea. And this is the first step. When I tell Dynflow to do this, it starts the plan phase and it starts to build the rest of the execution plan. So it starts planning how to make tea and it looks at the definition and it says, okay, so 
to make tea, I know I have to make basic tea, which is actually, you know, make the actual tea, prepare it and everything. So it goes to do that. And while doing that, it sees, okay, so to make tea, I need to boil the water. I need to take a cup. I need to put, I don't know what is, I need to put the tea back into the cup. I need to put the water into the cup and sugar. I need to wait for a bit and then I need to remove the tea bag. Once this is done, we basically finished the make basic tea step and we can go, go further. And now we have the tea and we can serve it. So the key takeaway in here is you tell Dynflow to do one thing. It, it traverses the tree while building the execution plan. It trickles down to the leaves and it just goes back and so on. And you can see that all this is linear. It's a depth first search. So it goes down, then it goes back and prepares the rest. Once this is done, the execution plan is ready to actually be executed. So it is passed to the executor and the executor can take a look. Now, there are two other phases. One is run, the other is finalize. And that's where the actual thing that the action should do, should do happens. So if I look into run, you can see all these colorful boxes. Uh, they show which steps each of the row, each of the rows is a step. Shows you know, which can be done at the same time and which should be done after each other. So in general, it is a sequence. We first need to prepare something, then we need to wait, and then we need to remove something. In the beginning, we need to boil water, boil water and get a cup. And we can do both of these things at once. We don't need to wait till the water is boiling to get a cup or the other way around. So we can do both at once. And once we have a cup, we can put the tea bag into it. We don't need the water for that. So that's what this represents. The key here is that even though in the plan phase, it was strictly a sequence, one step after the another, the actual ordering in the run phase can be different. So if you look at the plan, we can see that first we were boiling water and then taking a cup. Here in the run, we can see that we actually took the cup before we started boiling water. And that's the smart part about Dynflow. It tracks these things and it knows when it should run what. Instead of you know throwing a million of single type of things at Dynflow and saying just do it like you would with I don't know Sidekick or something. Dynflow doesn't try to be the most performant thing under the sun. It's more trying to be smart and orchestrate things. And then there's the finalized phase, which is just you know making finishing steps after everything is done. And it runs strictly as a sequence in the order the actions were planned. And those are the building blocks. There's the execution plan plan, which is a concrete plan how to do a thing. There is an action, which is a recipe for how to do a single thing. They can be composed. And each action can have a step in, the, in each of the phases. It can, it may not, it's not necessary. It just gives you a lot of flexibility on how to do things. And as I mentioned, uh, the actions can be as complex or as simple as you want them to be. Uh, for example, let's say I want to make an action which will greet anyone who runs it. 
So I just create a class which inherits from the end collection. I define the run method on it. And in that, I can do puts hello friend. Oh. And that's it. That's the simplest valid downflow action you can put together. Of course, you can knock yourself out. You can go as crazy as you want, but you don't have to. You can do things as just as simple as those. Now I can go back to the slides and I can move to features. Uh, one of the key things is the downflow allows you to suspend steps and means that each time a step is being executed in the run phase, it, it has to run somewhere, right? So it occupies an executor thread or something. And let's say you want to wait for a bit. You could do it the, the hard way and just put sleep in there. But that would, that would block the actual executor. It would still occupy the thread while the sleep is running. And to tackle this particular issue, Danflow supports suspending steps. So instead of hard sleeping and parking the thread, you can just suspend the step, uh, empty the thread or the runtime unit for, for other steps to run on. And then you can, again, wake up this suspended steps step by sending it an event, either after some time passed or when you receive some external API call or anything. Uh, Danflow also supports publish, subscribe, like usage using subscriptions. So you can say, well, when some kind of action is being planned, plan this other action as well. And this relationship, this subscription is defined in the action that is being subscribed to the other. So you can have an action, let's say, in Foreman, and then subscribe on it from a plugin. Uh, in Danflow, we also have execution plan hooks, which is actions can define a piece of code, which is run when the entire execution plan changes its own state. So for example, in remote execution, we send a notification when a remote execution job is finished. And we do this from the execution plan hooks. Danflow can also execute things in the future. So that's future execution. Uh, we have singleton actions in case there's some kind of action that you want to be sure that there's only one instance running at a time. That's what singleton action are for. Uh, we have support for subplans, which is when you have an execution plan, which has an action, and that action triggers another execution plan and waits for it to finish. So we have support for subplans like this. And if you have many subplans, we have support for batching them. Uh, this is still unmerged, but we have some kind of support for rollback rescue strategy. That means that for each action, you can define how to undo it. And then when something goes wrong, Dynflow knows where the execution stopped. So we can so it can undo all the changes made up until that point. But it's still not merged yet. It's more something like if you want to play with it or something. And Dynflow can also serve as an active job backend. That means you can write active jobs the way you would do normally and as all the tutorials guide you. But what, then when you call perform later on the active job, it actually gets executed by Dynflow. And with this, I will pass the microphone to Andrzej, 
we'll talk about form and tasks for a bit. Yes, so I will describe just what form and tasks are and uh, basically why uh, we uh, created them and uh, what are the features of, uh, of the form and tasks. What form and tasks are? So if you heard, uh, heard form and tasks, it's basically Dynflow. Uh, it's a middleman between uh, Foreman and Dynflow because as you've heard Adam, uh, Dynflow isn't Foreman specific. So we need to uh, make it Foreman specific and uh, add the Foreman, Foreman bits. Uh, it tries to provide uh, backend agnostic features, but uh, for now uh, there is only Dynflow uh, as a provider, and I think it's uh, gonna stay that way. And we are not going to introduce any other backends uh, because there is just uh, no need for that for now. Mm. Okay why we have introduced the form and tasks. So uh, again, we needed, needed uh, something to solve uh, our, our problem and we had the Dynflow already, but we needed to, inter uh, we needed to introduce it in the form and form and, form and project, uh, but making it directly in form and core didn't really make Makes sense, so we created another project that uh, would have a different pace, so we could uh, iterate uh, iterate more faster, and um, it was just the way to do it at the time. And we needed the to have a place where to put time flow specific code related to Foreman and Foreman specific code related to Dynflow and we created Foreman tasks and the Foreman task, the main main advantage is the task dashboard that uh, creates much better overview for the users than the actual Dynflow console because Dynflow console uh, exposes um, exposes a lot of Dynflow specific details that a normal user doesn't need to know and doesn't need to see. So what are the features of Foreman tasks and what are Foreman tasks bringing to uh, developers? So Foreman task has uh, Foreman specific middlewares like keep current that uh, ensures that the current user uh, is available for the action that is running in Dynflow, that the taxonomies are the same as, uh, the, as they were in the uh, action, action planner and all the context stays the same. Uh, delegation to the smart proxy. So we have we have Dynflow running uh, with Foreman and we have Dynflow running uh, running in smart proxy. You will see the uh, those concept a bit later, uh, but Foreman tasks are uh, exposing this to developer so we can run one uh, we can run from core, uh, form and core, we can run uh, the tasks on Dynflow proxy. We can plan recurring tasks. This is currently not the best, uh, best implementation there could be, but we are able to, <laughs> able to provide recurring tasks. So, Currently, they are used even in form and, form and core, and definitely it's better than uh, having users to 
do something in uh, in Chrome. We have uh, task groups that allows the uh, task being groups grouped in uh, uh, and run run together to make it easy for the users and developers to see what's happening. We can uh, lock resources. So the resources uh, can be specific to, uh, can be locked and touched only one uh, by one background job. And this uh, lock will make it make uh, it impossible for other tasks to um, and to do anything else with the resource at the time uh, at the same time as the task that's locking it. Linking is just that you are saying to other task, okay, I'm touching this resource, and but it's not um, not specific to to your task. Um that's about it for, for my task. And I will hand it over back to Adam. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, we are slowly running out of time, so I'll try to speed up and just blaze over the deployment. Uh, as you already heard, uh, oh, you haven't heard this part. There are essentially three ways how you can run Dimeflow on your foreman. First one is what most, in, most people in development do, and that is run Dimeflow inside the form and web process or the Rails process. Uh, this is probably the worst way to go about it, but it works for deployment. It's easy to set up, and it just works out of the box, even though it's not the most performant one. Uh, the other option is using a standalone executor, and there are two flavors of this. One is having all in one, everything in a single process. That's what we did uh, up until 2.0, to the zero, to the one, I'm not sure, uh, where you had the Dimeflow D service. It was a single process that had all the Dimeflow bits inside it, and that was it. And you could spawn multiple instances of this one. Then the other option is with Sidekick workers, which is what we do now. Then. This is the part you already heard. Uh, there can be Dimeflow running on the smart proxy. And again, there are two flavors on this. One is that you can run inside the smart proxy process, which is what we do on production deployments on Debian. And or it can be a standalone service. It's called smart proxy Dimeflow core. And that's what we do on enterprise Linux based distributions in production setups. Uh, this standalone service is deployed as a sidecar to the smart proxy and foreman talks to the smart proxy and smart proxy proxies the requests to the downfall core service now the same thing i just mentioned but with pictures uh, so this is the all-in-one there's the form of the process the executor is running inside of it uh, there's a postgres database outside of it and both foreman and the Dimeflow executor running inside of it talk to Postgres on its own. Uh, the next option is the deployment with Dimeflow D, where again, there's foreman on one side, you can have multiple instances or threads or processes, whatever. Uh, it talks to the database. And then on the other side, you can have multiple instances of the all-in-one executor and it talks, all the components talk through the database. And the last option is Sidekick, where, again, you have several formants, you have the Postgres database, and then you have several Sidekick processes which fulfill different roles. The Sidekick workers talk to each other through Redis, so you get Redis thrown into the mix. And this entire box, the orchestrator plus the workers plus the Redis, are essentially equivalent to what Dimeflow D used to be. 
just split into several processes. Uh, in theory, the scaling with the sidekick model is that you should just scale the workers and it should be fine for some time. Once it stops being enough, you can, in theory, deploy the entire box multiple times. So you duplicate the orchestrator, the workers, but you have to give them their own Redis instance or point them at a different Redis database. And then you accomplish essentially what would spawning multiple DimeFlowD instances do. Uh, we had a question, what is stored in Postgres and what is stored in Redis? So the answer to that is that everything is in Postgres because we have to maintain the compatibility with this deployment model. So everything important is in Postgres and Redis contains only the, the in-flight data or the internal data that Danflow needs in this specific model. It usually contains uh, sidekick jobs in a queue and the workers take them out of that. There's not much else stored in Redis, I guess. So I hope it answers that question. And finally, side-by-side -side comparison of deployment on the smart proxy. On the left, it's the Debian deployment where the Danflow executor is running inside the smart proxy. And on the right side, it's a, it's a standalone service with smart proxy in the middle between formants and the Danflow core. And of course, uh, you can roll your own. You can create some crazy Frankenstein deployment where you mix all these things together. But then I'm afraid you would be on your own. And I'll pass the last couple of slides back to Andre again. Yeah. And um, what was the main message uh, of this presentation? I think that the main message was uh, we already have Dynflow. We know it's not perfect, but it's around and it does its job. So uh, why not to use it? Let's, if you have any tasks that would be good to do on the background and in, in the in the Rails process, please try and create a Dynflow action if. Your experience is not the best. Uh, let us know, and we can try to improve improve it for the next time. And what <laughs> the next thing we would we would like to do is to merge foreman tasks into foreman uh, because uh, already foreman core uh, has the Dynflow 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 dependency. So there is no point to keep the formant tasks separately because if you already have Dynflow, you need formant tasks to use the Dynflow and the main dependence is the Dynflow. So there is not much uh, of the additional baggage that formant tasks are creating. So we would like to do it in the in the future. If you have any concerns with that, please let us know. Okay. And I think that's about it. And with that, we are slowly transitioning into the Q&A and we are about four minutes over time, I guess. So maybe we could move to the breakout session if anyone is interested. I don't see any immediate questions in the Q&A panel. I just posted a link to the breakout session if anyone would like to head over there and chat a bit more. So with that, we can skip to the last slide and say thank you for attending. Thank you for watching. We hope you try. We hope you give Dynflow a try and 
share with us how it goes. Thank you, Adam. And what was the what's the result of our, our poll, Mark, if you're there? Yeah, so I think it's actually quite positive. Uh, so the question was, are you able to write a Dynapo action? Uh, we got three votes for yes, one for one for no. But what is the most positive on that is no, but I'd like to. Uh, we have four votes for that option. OK, so this session was meant more about what Dynflow is and why we have it rather than how to use it. So if there's interest, we uh, I could put together a deep dive or something onto how to actually do how to actually use it, where we would go into the more code specific details, let's say. So we have depending on whose clock we're looking at, I think we have 13 minutes until the next session. If you'd like to discuss, perhaps, you know, I see Jeremy there would be very interested in a deep dive. If you'd like to discuss these things further, perhaps move over to the breakout. And in the meantime, we'll have a break and then we'll be back with Zach, I think it is, and Jenkins and how to use it at uh, 22 the hour. Thank you very much. And I'll stop the recording.